Earl Clark, and uh, my father, Q Evans, um, Hustle Boss, and Pickless Dad, Charles Hampton, Neil McKinnon, Neil McChristy, McKinnon Street, drove all the way from Croatia. <laughs> and then we have um, some special uh, visitors from the town of Leadville, and I can't tell you all, all how um, what wonderful hospitality we have from Leadville. And so we have um, Ann Doherty. Can you just uh, stand forward and raise your hand? And she is the public relations. <laughs> Up here at Cooper, the ski lodge, which is basically closed in the summer, and they were kind enough to let us use it anyway. And um, up working hard in the kitchen at Cooper, fixing your lunch, is uh, Harry Camp and his daughter Kelly. And then we have the mayor of Leadville here, which we're delighted to have, Chet Gady. And then our treasurer, now are you at the high school? I'm retired. You're retired, all right. <laughs> to live here. <laughs> okay, so we have our trumpeter, David Schutte, who was the director of the band for the memorial services for many years. So we had some very special contributors here. And uh, without saying anything further, we'll get started with that. What a wonderful day to be here. Good afternoon and welcome veterans, descendants, associates, distinguished guests and friends of the 10th Mountain Division. This place and areas nearby, and as we've heard, hold many memories. Locals know that nearly some 140 years ago, this pass was named, recognizing the prospectors from Tennessee who came searching for gold, silver, and ore. And shortly thereafter, a railroad was built benefiting not only the mines and nearby towns, but the countless numbers of others who would travel through these mountains, admiring its beauty. But for us present here today, different memories are evoked. This is the place where our fathers trained at nearby Camp Hale, and we are familiar with their story. Train loads of young men chugging up these mountains and billowing fumes of dark, thick smoke stopping at nearby Pando to drop off their precious cargo. Barracks full of life and some mischief with the energy, spirit, and creativity that only 18, 19, and 20-year-olds can bring. A unique esprit de corps and echoes of 90 pounds of rucksack, Ula the ski yumper, underneath the takeoff, two boards, and other songs of the tank of the tenth being sung. Training, training, and more training, often under extreme conditions. Skiing, climbing, and the infamous D series maneuvers above timberline in sub zero temperatures. But most important of all, those special friendships that were formed. A type of fraternal love that I think can only be experienced in times of war when life can be taken away at any given moment. When one fights for not only principles of freedom or good or evil, but for your foxhole buddy and the soldier next to you. Many of those friendships continue today and it is quite touching to witness your camaraderie and bonds of brotherhood at conventions, chapter gatherings, or other 10th events. Sadly, some of those friendships were cut short years ago. Kiska, Mount Belvedere, Pietra Colora, Punchboard Hill, Castel de Año, and the Po Valley are but a few places where comrades fell and gave their lives. Today we remember and we commemorate not only these 992 soldiers whose names are engraved on this monument, but also the many who have since died after the war. They will always be our heroes. Memories, 
stories, and deeds of valor long ago, but forever etched in our hearts. What a wonderful day to be here. Let's bow together for a time of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you for a beautiful day in one of the most gorgeous settings in the world. We're reminded of your creation, and as we, as representatives of the 10th Mountain Division, as veterans, as descendants, as family members and friends, we know this is a very sacred place to us. We thank you for your love and your grace that is extended to us. We who are people of faith are grateful that you have provided a way that not only gives us a, abundant life in this life, but eternal life. We stand here today to honor nearly a thousand men who paid the supreme sacrifice, uh, men who did not come home to their wives or to their children. We are mindful of the sacrifice they made that allow us to still pledge allegiance to our flag and be a part of a country that's free. We're also mindful of other veterans of the 10th Mountain Division who've passed away since the war, and we're thankful for their contribution. And we're grateful for the veterans that are with us today and others who still remind us of what this division meant and what they meant to each other and what it means to our country. We're thankful, Father, for everything, every blessing we have, and it is our prayer that their work and their sacrifice and their fight, fighting would not be in vain, but that our country would remain strong, that it would remain free, and that our children and our grandchildren will be able to enjoy the benefits that many of us enjoy today. Thank you again for the special significance of this unique group of men and the privilege we have today to honor them and thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <coughs> A poem has been prepared by Erling Olund one of our Norwegian 10th Mountain men who has had a great gift through the years of his writings, that you and I read his poem to you. We have come home again to share a mountain soldier's legacy, to Cooper Hill's clear alpine air, where mountain soldiers learn to ski. Come home to Colorado Hills, to where we lived at High Camp Hill, and learned our mountaineering skills, and trained in winter's frigid gale. You and I come home again to celebrate our history, to honor all 10th Mountain men who share in our great victory. We think of them, the mountain men, who went from hail to Texas heat, there we learn that once again, the infantry moves on its feet. And then at last, yes finally, we were embarked for Europe's shores. We came to fight in Italy, and there were blood in the war. We mountain soldiers went online, and you and I are still alive. We can recall the Scheller mine that took its toll in 45. The early contacts, night patrol, were but a prelude, prelude to, the, to attack. There was the time that tried our souls. The 10th Division ne'er turned back. Then Riva Ridge and Belvedere fell to our silent, swift assault. That bloody battle brought its fear, for even brave men know that fault. The charging 10th Division broke the German mountain line at last. And we recall the fire and smoke as comrades withered in the blast. To battle thus was why we trained in these high hills where we found strength. And so the victory was gained because we preserved at length from mountain valley to the top 
we slogged our way and drove them out. Once we got going, we'd not stop until the Germans were en route. Then we broke through the final hills and saw the plain, the distant Po. We used our well-learned mountain skills to beat a fierce and relentless foe. We never stopped to count the cost. We never really knew the price. Through, though, full of, though a full thousand men were lost and thousand more were sacrificed of arm or leg or precious blood, like infantry, like infantry in wars before. We fought in snow and ice and mud and did not bother to keep score. We won. We won our victory. Then wearied by the sweat and strain, we learned what now we clearly see, that war is deadly, filled with pain. With pain, we now remember well the mountain men whose life we shared. We ran beside them when they fell. We're one with them when we all dared to spend the fullness of our lives on mountain heritage of hope, a certain hope that still survives as we fought forward up the slope, those mountains now known this day of peace. These mountains now are peaceful still. We knew that war would one day cease. We had no wish to maim or kill. We have come home again to meet beside a stone that's filled with names of comrades for whom life was sweet and made worthwhile by mountain gaze. Come home to where it all began, where this division had its birth, where mountain boy became a man and knew the glory of his earth. This, this earth, earth has taken them to rest, will take us soon as well we know. By them the whole of earth is blessed, by us, because we love them so. But we've come home again to live, to live with love that they must feel. Because it is love that we give, and that is something much more real than all the shameful acts of war. So we've come home to mountain peace, to men and hills we loved before, and so shall love till life shall cease.
push it while it's yeah. on standby. Yeah, let me then just... I move to stop. Oh, now it's record. <coughs> this is Myrna Hampton. We're at a Descendants uh, board meeting in Leadville, Colorado. It's uh, July 21st, 2003. And I'm talking to Neil here, and he's going to be introducing himself. I'm Neil McKinstry. I was born in Jackson, Wyoming, July 9th, 1919. My folks left that country so that we children, my two sisters and I, could have better schools. They moved to uh, Colorado. My father had a silver fox ranch near Gilpin. And in the winter, we kids stayed in our home in Denver, went through the schools there. Oh, and then you joined him in the summertime at the ranch, huh? In the summer and some weekends, we were up in the ranch. We, we had our saddle horses, rode all over the mountains. And how did you hear about the 10th Mountain Division? Well, I heard about it a lot later on, of course. I okay. didn't know about it then. Okay. Were you drafted? No, I, I dodged the draft by Ooh. enlisting. Okay. I, I was in Montana at the time, and uh, we went to the reception center, I guess they called it Fort Lewis, Washington. There were seven of us in that group that were sent direct to a searchlight battalion, an outfit in the desert in California. I don't know why they had to skip basic training, but we went right into this outfit. Hmm. We varied from education-wise. Two of us had uh, college degrees, and uh, down to a logger that uh, was illiterate. Oh. So I, I often wondered how they picked us. <laughs> What's a searchlight outfit? What's a searchlight outfit? A searchlight battalion was part of the anti-aircraft artillery. They uh, use these searchlights at night. Uh, one, one purpose was to try to spot raiding airplanes. They were also used later on as a defensive uh, light shining into the enemy lines that made it more difficult for them to, uh, to function against our lines. Oh. But the, uh, the day we, uh, we reached the searchlight battalion, the colonel in charge told us two college graduates we'd go to OCS in 90 days, and we and did. And where'd you graduate from college, Neil? And I, where'd you graduate from college? I graduated from college at Colorado A&M, which ah. is now Colorado State University. Okay. My subject, uh, my primary subject was range management. Okay. Uh, I always loved the outdoors, the ranching industry, so uh -huh. that fit in very well. So did you go to OCS? Yes, we went to OCS. Where was that? Through the heat of the summer, Camp Davis, New North Carolina. Uh -huh. So I learned uh, <laughs> learned about the South. Uh huh. And uh, having just got out of college, I was able to. Uh, except the studying we had to do pretty well. Mm -hmm. I came out with pretty high grades, so they kept me as an instructor in mathematics and map reading. Oh. It was... Uh, what after, year was this? What year? What year oh, was this? Oh, went, uh, I went there in 1942. Okay, and you enlisted in 1941? In, well, it was earlier in 42. Okay. In March. Okay. I left my job in March. So I did read an article in, in the paper then while uh, after I'd been there at the camp for most of a year. So I, I asked my commanding officer if I could apply. So I did get my three letters of recommendation. The commanding officer said, well, if they accept you, it'll take a month or two before you get away. Within a week, I was at Camp Hale. Oh. And what time of year was this? Well, that was October. October of 1940. 1940, 42, 43. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. We pulled into Leadville in the bus and at night 
here I came out of warm North Carolina. Oh my gosh. Hit, hit Leadville in the late at night, cold, no no room, no no transportation to camp at that time. So uh -huh. we just slept on the floor and they picked us up in the morning, took us to camp. Boy, I bet you were cold, huh? Oh we got used to it yeah. in a hurry. Yeah. But Did I they pick so, you up in trucks? Did, Did they pick you up in a truck? I don't uh -huh. remember what they picked us uh -huh. up in, probably a jet truck or a jeep. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. And then what happened when you got to Camp Hale? Well, we were assigned to the 727 AAA, an aircraft artillery machine gun battalion. So our, our weapon was a 50 caliber machine gun to protect us from, air, from aircraft. Oh. And that's, we trained that way there at Camp Hale. We sometimes use sleds to pull our, our equipment, sometimes carried them on our backs where sleds weren't practical. How did you target practice with such a huge weapon? Uh, the and target practice, we went to Fort Bliss. There was a camp outside of Fort Bliss they called Waco Springs, where it was in, uh, way out in the desert, mm. where we uh, fired on uh, aerial targets, pulled light aircraft pulled the targets and we could fire on them. Now did you participate in the D-series then with... Oh yes, yes we had. I was in the D-series. Uh -huh. uh -huh. We were out of the barracks like everybody else for five weeks straight. Did you have to haul those guns around on that sled when you were in D-series? Oh yeah, that was part of it. We had uh -huh. to maintain our gun. Wow. Those, those 50 calibers, as anybody that's worked with them knows, we we break them down, the barrel, the receiver, and the mount. And they experimented on us with different mounts. But uh, one, one stout man could carry a receiver or the mount. And how much did those weigh about? As I remember, the receivers are something like 80 pounds. Wow. And huh. the mounts, depending on the mounts, might have been the same. The barrel was a little lighter. So carrying those heavy rucksacks prepared you for carrying those guns well, later right, on. Right, right. As, as part of our practice, we would carry those machine guns, set them up on some of the hills just west of camp. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. that was a backpack. Oh. We, we only did that about one time. Most of the time we were using sleds or... Sometimes we were just out on bivouac without the heavy weapons. How old were you then? I must have been about 24. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you were uh, a more mature man compared to the... Well, age. I had uh, gotten through college. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I got out of college in 1941. Okay. So yeah, a lot, of the, a lot of the people in the outfit were younger than I was. So did they listen to you? Oh, pretty well, yeah. <laughs> what was, what's your most vivid memory, your best, uh, a good memory you have of that time that's most vivid? At, at that time, guys, I don't know if there's anything in particular. Mm -hmm. It's just all getting uh, accustomed to a different, different life, mm -hmm. different surroundings. You were used to the cold having grown up in Colorado, though, so... You knew what to expect in the winter. Oh time. yes, after I got to Camp Pale, yes, I, I was used to the cold. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We uh, we were issued good clothing. That was one advantage we had over some of the other troops that were serving in Europe. They just weren't equipped nearly as well as we were clothing wise. Uh -huh. So, what were the layers of clothes you put on? How many layers when you went on the D series? If you had to get dressed in the morning, what did you do? Well, we had our long underwear, uh -huh. which was very welcome. We had our, our just woolen khakis. They weren't khakis, woolen, woolen uh, ODs. Uh -huh. And uh, then we were, issued, uh, we were issued a very warm vest. It was so warm I couldn't wear mine. Oh. I generally wore over my uh, woolens a sweater. And then we had parkas, the parkas that cut the wind out. 
And you, the parkas were all white, right? The parkas were reversible. Oh, uh -huh. so the white side, or you could turn them inside out and have a tan side, uh -huh. or an OD side. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then our sleeping bags, uh, they issued us double down sleeping bags. Well, I couldn't stand the two bags. I left the inner bag at home at oh. camp. So you them. must have a, a high body temperature. You don't have a hard time staying warm. Well, I don't know. I'm not too much, uh -huh. I guess. Uh, I, I just love that uh, winter we spent at camp. I don't know why I was crazy enough to. <laughs> what was it you loved about it? What did you love about oh, it? Oh, being outdoors, sleeping mm -hmm. out. Stre the hikes, we mm -hmm. had strenuous hikes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in our battalion, we did, some of us, the officers and some of the non-coms learned to ski. I did, I was not a skier. I'd just been an outdoor person. That's uh -huh. how I got my letters of recommendation. Uh -huh. Did you do the rock climbing then? Since well, I went through the rock climbing course. I enjoyed uh -huh. that. Uh -huh. Of course, it was just very basic. I enjoyed it. Uh -huh. What were you doing when the other guys were skiing? What were you doing? When we weren't skiing? Well, yeah. <laughs> you, you, weren't, you didn't ski, right? What did you do just, instead? Uh, just occasionally we uh -huh. had a skiing exercise. Uh -huh. Mostly we just, we either had horse or snowshoes or at Camp Hale we had the shoe packs, which I, they were excellent winter wear. Uh -huh. Did you work with the mules at all since you'd grown up on a ranch? I just went with the mule packers one time. They were assigned to move our camp. Uh -huh. So I, I got to go with the mule packers one time. We camped right now at the, what is now the present site of Vail. And uh, huh. I had worked, grown up quite a bit with horses, so uh -huh. I, I had not ridden a mule till that time, but I greatly enjoyed going with those mule uh -huh. packers. So, How did you meet your friend Hassel? How did you guys meet? He was the mess sergeant in Company A of the battalion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we... Did you, like, did you like his cooking? Yeah, he, he was a good mess sergeant, very uh -huh, good. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, what was so. the favorite thing that you ate there? That was, I don't know. Uh -huh. One thing I liked at Camp Hale, I understand we got rations and a half. Uh -huh. So we, we were fed very well. Never went hungry then. Yeah, well, we had, of course, had good appetites up there. We were very active in cold weather. Uh -huh. High altitude was good for the appetite. Now, what did you do on your when you had to leave? Where did you go? Did you come here to Leadville, or did you go? Well, I didn't. I occasionally went to Denver with the guys. Mm -hmm. I didn't ever go to Leadville. Mm -hmm. uh, time or two, I went home. My parents lived near Fort Collins at that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I sometimes I just enjoyed being in camp mm -hmm. and being in the mountains. Hmm. What do you think your worst What's your worst memory? Most uncomfortable, or somebody told you to do something you didn't want to do? What was your worst memory? Oh, I don't remember any worst times in huh? yeah. at Camp Hale. Uh-huh. Okay. I mean, there were times, you know, when the wind was blowing, it was blizzarding, we weren't so fond of getting out in it, but uh, we were out in it in any weather. Mm -hmm. Part of the training. So you just you just liked it all around, huh? Well, basically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I hate to try it now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How did you feel when you went to um, Camp Swift? Well, I was very fortunate there too. Uh, the uh, battalion had to send some officer to a uh, chemical warfare school at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. And since I was a Colorado native, they were good enough to assign me to that task. So I, I was there for a month while the rest of the troops were down there at Camp Swift. Oh. But, and I'd read these memos telling them how to survive the heat. <laughs> you were glad not to Very be there. Very thankful I was there. 
Why did you study at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal? What did you learn? Well, quite a bit about chemical warfare, how to gas, and uh, using smoke. Uh, uh -huh. Just uh, stuff that we should be able to uh, help help our troops with. And then when did you join up with the 10th Mountain again? Well, then after I was through with school, they sent me back to my unit. Uh -huh. And when we got to Camp Swift, they decided, since the Luftwaffe was pretty well wiped out, they changed our unit to an anti-tank battalion. And we had 57 millimeter anti-tank guns, which were kind of interesting things mm. to shoot. Mm. Every round was a tracer, and you actually swung them with your shoulder just like a shotgun. Mm. Mm. And uh, being in anti-tank put us in infantry instead of anti-aircraft artillery. So we were, we were therefore infantrymen, though we were not fully trained as infantrymen. Mm. Mm. When we got to Italy, we never saw our 57 millimeter guns again. Oh, they, you never did. They after... weren't mobile enough to oh. get up over the mountains. After all that training, huh? So well, <laughs> that's right. We. Did. Now, what ship did you go over to Italy on? Do you remember the ship that you went? I don't remember. It was one of those Liberty ships. Uh -huh. We went in a convoy. Uh-huh. Do you remember when that was that you left? We left Camp Swift for, for Patrick Henry, the port, mm -hmm. on Christmas Eve, mm -hmm. or on Christmas Day. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. I've never liked Christmas since. You never? <laughs> I bet. Were you scared? Were you, were you afraid? Were you afraid of where you were going? Or? Oh, yeah, no. No, we, uh, no, uh -huh. we uh, weren't too afraid. We, we understood we were going to Italy, uh -huh. all right. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But, you know, it's, you're always a little nervous. Sure, right? sure. Even in a convoy, you know, you could get tor torpedoed. Yes. Now, so, um, you weren't with the 86th then. You must have gone with the 85th or the 87th. Uh, division to go over there, huh? I don't remember who else was on the ship with us. Uh -huh. I remember we had some Air, some Air Force people on with us. Uh -huh. How was the crossing? Had you ever been on a ship before? Not in ocean, no. Did no. you get seasick? Oh, I, I kind of enjoyed it. <laughs> Most of the guys are sitting in the, in the cabin playing poker, but I'd rather, I could get up on, on the deck look out and then I wouldn't get seasick if uh -huh. I'd get down where the walls were all moving then I'd start getting woozy. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I usually, I like to just be up on the deck mm -hmm. watching the ocean. Where did you first see land when you crossed the Atlantic? We, we landed at Naples. Did you go through the Straits of Gibraltar? Yes. Yeah? Yeah, everybody did that went over uh -huh. there. Yes, we landed in Naples, a thing that impressed me. That we could see these hulls of sunken ships in the harbor. Mm. That they had been bombed. They had been bombed. They had been sunk, sunk there. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And we went then uh, up into northern Italy by uh, motor convoy. So you didn't have to walk then. They were. They had you. Well, on we walked. The, as I remember the first night in Naples. We uh, camped in the King's Forest. And I was so impressed with the Italian, the young Italians and groups that go through the area singing. Oh. And oh. at the chow line, the hungry little kids would be begging food from the soldiers. Uh -huh. So you were impressed with their spirit because they were at war, but they were still singing, the young Italians? Well, it's just interesting, you uh -huh. know, they are, you know, a musical race. Yes, yes. What's the King's Forest like? What is that? Is that a... Oh, it was, it's just a, an open area with, with forest. Uh -huh. uh, it was just a good place for us to... Did it have a lot of cover? Did the trees, were the trees still... Um, seemed like we had, I don't remember if we put up for tents or not. Uh-huh. We, uh, a lot of things, uh, my memory is very poor. Uh -huh. Well, people, you're doing very, very well. It doesn't seem poor to me. But. Well, people I served with, the last minute you remember this, you remember that. 
have the faintest clue. <laughs> well, you know, different people remember different things. Well, that's right. Yeah, yeah. That's They're, why we do these oral histories, because one person will remember one thing and another person will remember something that's else. That's true. It all fits together like a puzzle. The thing that impressed me going up through Italy in our motor convoy was a destruction of all those, a lot of houses were built of stone. They were, some of them just piled of rubble and others mm -hmm. damaged greatly. Mm -hmm. So I was so thankful for our country that we had never suffered such thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you, you saw a lot of people, hungry people too, with the children begging for food? Well, as mostly the people around the chow line. Uh -huh. uh, of course, well, later on, we further, well, even after the war, there were lots of people that hang around the camps, and make friends with the soldiers, that especially hang around the kitchens. Uh huh. Uh huh. How was that handled? How did they handle that? Was it hard to give away your food? I mean, did you give it away? Well, or? mostly the kids just take, you know, so soldiers wouldn't eat everything, so I would give some. Uh huh. Of course, you know, we we did our own eating. <laughs> That's right, you needed to do that too. And the different ones, I'm sure, did different things, mm -hmm. but you know, you couldn't help but want to help those kids. Mm -hmm. Now, were you with Hassel at that time too? Did you guys stick together he, during the he war? He was with us, he was with us right up till, uh, he, he was wounded about the second day we were in action. He, uh, uh, Grenade went off, I think, in his foxhole or next to it. And that was, you were on Reaver Ridge as well, yes. huh? Yes, yes, our, mm -hmm. uh, after the 86 took Reaver Ridge, our battalion was sent up to hold the, to hold the uh, ridge. And at that time, then Hassel, instead of being mess sergeant, he was just in the line with the rest of it. And I didn't get up there until a day later. I forget, I had some detail. And so I, uh, I went up and found my outfit the second day. Mm -hmm. In fact, as I was hiking up Reaver Ridge, there was a trail I went up. I could see the action on Belvedere. The attack on Belvedere mm -hmm. had started. Mm. Wow. That's pretty impressive, huh? Did you stay down, which drain, which trail did you take, do you remember? Which peak did you go toward? Well, as I understood it, it was probably about the only simple trail because of course 86 had climbed up, they'd fixed ropes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I understand they had four different routes. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. So did you have to take those ropes to go? No, no, I had a uh, perfectly good trail to hike up. I had been warned by somebody when I got to a certain point to look out. There was a wounded German in a foxhole and they weren't sure but what he'd do a little sniping. Oh. And uh, you could hear him crying out for help. Oh. And uh, people were a little suspicious that he was just trying to get somebody up. Uh-huh. So Lots what happened? Of, what happened? Well, I just went on by. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I avoided getting close to his foxhole. Do they send you up there by yourself or were you with another? I just walked up by uh -huh. myself. And your unit at that time was called? Uh, my unit, the battalion was strung out along the river. And which Red. battalion was it? What? Well, it was the anti-tank battalion. Okay, anti-tank battalion. Okay. And, uh, Captain Goodfellow, Commander Company A, told me to go out there to the point. We were in Campo de Posse, Posse de Campiano, mm -hmm. the uh, very end point at River Ridge. And so what did you do when you got out there? You saw the action going on at Belvedere. Well, I found myself a foxhole. Uh, part of the, there was one element, a bunch of 86 was still there. Uh -huh. And there were really just a few of our people there, and they were dug in. And the next morning we were hit with a counter attack. And uh, 86, fortunately they were, I didn't know what, what all was going on. They just said, go down there. And <laughs> I didn't have, 
communication or anything. Uh -huh. Huh. So I was... Uh, How long were you there? Well, we stayed there for two weeks. Oh, you were there yeah, a long time weeks. then. Yeah, we were just... After that first attack, we kept, we'd get occasional mortar shelling. And, uh, well, one or two of the guys did suffer injuries even after the main attack. Now, had you, were you going up when Hassel was coming down? Had he been wounded? No, Hassel was up there. Uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, doctors, the medical doctors, had given me a, a vial of uh, morphine. He said, you might need that for somebody. So, uh. Here I learned Hassel had been hurt. I went to his foxhole. He was in great pain. So I gave him half of the dose of what I had. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what you said to him when he said, do you know how to do this? <laughs> I don't know. He's, he told me later it sure helped, but they got him evacuated then. He said to me that, that he, he told you that, well, do you know how to do this? And you said you'd done it to horses so you could well, do it to him? Well, that's what he tells people. That's not... <laughs> you don't think that's true? <laughs> well, it makes but, a good story, though, I'll huh? just leave it there. <laughs> I've shot lots of horses with dope since then. I had not shot too many before that. <laughs> maybe Hassel was your first patient, huh? <laughs> he was one of my first. <laughs> well, he's the only one. I don't know what happened uh, to the rest of the other half of the uh, morphine. Hassel said before he got down to, to the uh, real health that he wished it, I'd given him another hand too. <laughs> so you were out there for two weeks. What kind of guns were you using then since you didn't use that 57? Oh, right? well, right there where we were, all we had were our rifles. I had one of those uh, 30 caliber carbines. The first shell that hit near me scattered dirt on it and I wouldn't punch it. So. Oh. I hated those things after that. I, I picked up a, a you know, Springfield and carried that instead. Probably felt more reliable at that well, point. Yeah, huh? that, I was disgusted with that little car being. Did that happen to other people too, do you think? I, don't, I didn't hear of anybody else wow. having that trouble with them. Wow. That dirt shirt sure put by my eyes. So you're out there for two weeks, and then what, what, what happened next? Well, then we, uh, we were relieved by the British Expeditionary Force. And it was, that was kind of traumatic. Those guys, they'd come around with their flashlights looking in foxholes. <laughs> it's, it's a wonder we didn't draw a lot of mortar fire. But yes. We so oh, we, is, were, we were That doesn't seem very smart, does we it? We were thankful to get off of the hill. But from then on, we just went into different positions. Now, one of the uh, fellows that had been a driver for our outfit after the war, a fellow named Wally Reed, has uh, done a lot of research on exactly where the 8th Battalion went, what they did. Mm -hmm. And he, just the other day, I received a nice write-up from him, his, his whole write-up that he developed. He went through the army records, he interviewed people. Some of our units had been sent to Trieste as a buffer against... Uh, against Tito? With Tito. The, uh -huh. Tito. <laughs> I have those senior moments <laughs> regularly. <laughs> so, you went on to... Where did you go next, geographically, after you were done on Riva? Where well, did you go? I can't tell you. We just went different places along that. Uh -huh. We just occupied different places. And that's one thing that I feel uh, very sad about not remembering, because uh -huh. I can't correlate it with Wally Reed's account. Uh -huh. we, uh, when we went on a uh, reunion trip in 1988, we stayed at Casaldiano. And I thought the country looked familiar and I might find one of our positions, but uh, I didn't. Mm -hmm. I roamed around there and an Italian man picked me up, showed me where the uh, foxholes were. He lived right in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I made some nice Italian friends there. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's good. Well, it looks very different because the trees have all grown up. Oh, the trees have grown up, yeah. and there are a lot of, I call them modern buildings. Uh -huh. they, were, uh -huh. they were some cheaper construction, I'd say. Uh -huh. like, our, like the motel, the hotel we stayed in, it was a rather a primitive hotel. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. comfortable, but kind of primitive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there were quite a number of those. Did you, um, so quite a few of the guys stayed in villas sometimes, when, uh, what? in villas, when they, they were bivouacked. Oh, now before, when we first went in, went into uh, that area, we were near Viti Shiatico, and we did stay in a nice villa. And when we were back on the uh, reunion trip, I tried to spot it, but uh, I, I never did. We. Mm -hmm. We did go to Viti Shiatico one time, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I, I never did spot the villa we stayed in. No one else could either. It's changed a lot, so it's hard. It's well, hard to... yeah, but it was distinctive enough. It had a long driveway, tree-lined driveway up to the villa, and I think I would have recognized wow. it. Well, we were there for in that villa for quite a while. Hassel tells about helping build a shower. I remember that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it wasn't the most uh, comfortable accommodation either, but it was a lot better than living in a foxhole. Yes. I guess you had to sleep on the floor, or did they have furniture? Yeah, I think we slept on the floor, as uh -huh. I remember. It's all cold, probably cold kind marble. Of, kind of firm. <laughs> yes, I bet so. But you were pretty tough after that, huh? Yeah, I don't remember. It. I think we had to. I remember sleeping on the floor in some places. Uh -huh. I remember one place we stayed, it was a, a training school for the, for the young Italian guys going into the army. Oh. And uh, it was different. How was it different? <laughs> I'll tell you, the, the restrooms, the latrines were just whole, holes in the floor along. Oh. Huh. <laughs> kind of, kind of. Sophisticated holes. <laughs> Still holes. Place, huh? place for the soldier to put its feet. <laughs> <laughs> did they have, um, most of the places that you stayed, did the people take all their furniture out? Did they go hide their, their things, say, in the villa? Was there anything left? I don't remember much of any furniture. Now there, I don't know if it all been stolen with the Germans or no telling what might have happened. Hmm. Well, could I, have been a, I just don't remember. It could much. have been a combination of both of them. And that was the, yeah, any of the few places we stayed in the building, I don't remember furniture. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Do you have any vivid memories of the buddies that you met? Did you guys pull some uh, uh, jokes on each other? Do you remember any good, good things you did to each other? Oh, we just, uh, I don't know. Uh, one person I remember most vividly was one of our sergeants, Steve Worley's father, Norman. Uh, he was a sergeant of the mine, our mine platoon, and he was a very, he was an excellent non-com. Mm -hmm. And uh, those non-coms were a very important part of the army. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What made him so good? Oh, he just... He was a big, a stout fellow, and he he knew what he was doing. He he was well trained. Mm -hmm. He uh, he was responsible, I think, for setting up our perimeter defense. And we, the the group first went down there to Pisa di Campiano, and he had that all pretty well in hand when I got there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you had and a good then, working. I don't know. I was I was with him long. A lot of times, off and on, mm -hmm. he was wounded up there, but he came back. He, he, uh, in that first counterattack, he, uh, one of the German potato masher grenades blew up part near in his face. A lesser man. Are those but, S ones? Are those the S ones that someone was talking? No, about? they were had a wooden handle like an old-fashioned potato masher. Oh, and, and they just they throw them. They weren't a, a uh, 
fragmentation grenade like ours, they just explosive. Mm -hmm. But uh, Norman Worley, he wouldn't go down till he was sure everything was in order. I, I told him we'll get down, and he rode the tram down finally. Mm -hmm. But they patched him up and he came back to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, Hassel was uh, wounded badly enough, he couldn't come back. Mm -hmm. How about any of your other buddies? Well, those are the two of my particular acquaintances uh -huh. that uh, we did lose some other people. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I remember one older fellow that was in our group. I don't know, he must have been 10, 15 years older than most of the guys. And he was, he was not a warrior type anyway, and he was one of the first fatalities. Mm -hmm. I always felt real sorry. Somehow I felt more sorry for him even than some of the others. Because he was just not really supposed to be there. He was kind of a fish out he of water. He was there and, uh, well, we had to censor mail. The officers, we had to send, which a job I hated. But How do you do that? I remember in one of his letters he said some things he shouldn't, but I pointed out to the captain, mm. he was writing his wife. Mm. I guess that's one reason I felt sorrier for him, because his wife was, he was married, a lot of the guys were single, didn't have a wife to worry about then. Probably had some kids too, huh? I don't know, oh. he might have. So when you censor a letter, do you just black it out, what's not to be uh, sent I, uh, mail, I guess we did. I don't remember ever finding but that one thing that I thought was a, a, a violation uh -huh. and the captain just talked to him about uh -huh. it. So most of the guys, they followed directions. They didn't put anything in there that would compromise. The, I, the that's man. the only thing that I remember ever finding. Mm -hmm. And you know, I learned some things about the guys. I, Mm -hmm. Didn't really particularly want to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, I could see that would be difficult. That'd be yeah, hard. some of them told things that probably they didn't want their wives. Well, they wrote their wives, but they mm -hmm. didn't always tell them the cat they do. How about um, where were you when the war ended? Oh, we were. Uh, at camp, uh, we were in Denver, but uh, hmm, we had gotten back, well that's when the Japan surrendered, that was the final mm -hmm. war. Mm -hmm. How about and, in Italy though, when you got in where? Germany, where were we? Oh, we were up at uh, camp by Lake Garda. Uh-huh. Yeah, we, we moved up in there, uh, now that's where we were in another villa. Again, I don't remember furniture or what, what was there, uh -huh. Uh -huh. but it was, a, it was a beautiful ground we were on. How did you hear, you weren't one of the guys that went to Mussolini's villa, were you? When no, you... I never got to Mussolini's okay. villa. Okay. Uh, it wasn't until we went back on a reunion trip, we had a trip on Lake Garden, they showed us where yeah. it was, it was across the lake from where we were. So how did you hear word that the Germans had surrendered? What was, how, how did, what was the context that you well, learned? Well, you know, to ask me, I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> so I told you I don't remember uh -huh, much. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Can you think back? I, I don't. Did they send you, I mean, did the, your officer come in, your commanding officer come in and tell you, or was well, it just... I'm sure somebody told us. Uh-huh. And I just don't... Uh, You know, you'd think a person would remember that, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> How did you feel when it was over? Oh, of course, we were all delighted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We knew it, we could tell it was coming because once we got across the Po River, you know, we, the Germans were just surrendering. Did you take a lot of prisoners of war yourself? Never took a one. Well, mm -hmm. I guess I took, I took a few one time, mm -hmm. but. They were surrendering, they were just coming back and surrendering. 
Now, you didn't get wounded at all. You made it through. Yeah, I was very fortunate. Uh -huh. Very fortunate in that regard. So, what happened to you after you came home? You you came home on a ship, probably, and. Yeah, we well we came home on a ship, and while we were still on the water, we got word about the A bombs being dropped. You see, we were. Having gotten to Italy among the last units, we were about the first to go to Japan. And uh, I guess on the ship probably I had seen our new TO, Table of Organization, and we were to get some real and a tank guns, be a real and a tank unit. That's probably why you remember Japan surrendering, because you were worried that you were going to have to go to Japan. Well, we figured we were going to go, yeah. and uh, from what we've heard later, we probably never would have survived. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They said the Japanese would have defended that their homeland desperately, mm -hmm. and the extremely high casualties were expected on both sides. Mm -hmm. so. so, when you came home on your ship, where did you? How did you get back to? Did you come back to Colorado? Well, they sent us to Fort Logan as the name of the place. Uh -huh. And then the night, the, the day of the surrender of Japan, they confined us to camp, or to the fort. They thought we'd probably tear up Denver. <laughs> <laughs> but as I remember, they provided free beer and went through bed. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And then what happened next? Well, eventually we went back to Camp, Camp Carson and uh, broke up the unit, deactivated the unit. And then we went, uh, I was discharged finally in uh, Salt Lake City. And um, do you remember the date for that? I'm trying to remember the name of that fort. There. Hmm. No, I don't. Okay. How about the date? What date would that have been? Anyway. The date. What date would it be? The date. Well, my my actual discharge. I, I had a lot of terminal leave added up. I didn't. That went until. Well, it went until about May of the next year. Uh -huh. You see, after we got back, they couldn't discharge us all at once. So we had a rather long period. They just didn't know what to do with us, really. And I was sent to Camp Campbell, Kentucky for a while. We were there at Christmas, the next Christmas. And then I was sent to um, Fort Eustis, there at uh, Well, that's where I embarked, disembarked. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. When I was there, I was made a mess officer of a German camp, a German barracks. Oh. That was that was a good experience. I'd walk in a mess hall, they'd say, Octung, <laughs> and bring out some delicious pastries. <laughs> <laughs> so that was pretty good duty. Mm. Finally, Finally, it took, seemed to take forever why they said I'd be discharged. Mm -hmm. So you were discharged, they kind of moved you around and moved you to Salt yeah, Lake City? Yeah, just kind of moving around. In the meantime, after uh, I, got, I got married in uh, September then after, of the year of the war ended. Was so this my, a, was my this wife a was with me on all these. Oh, so she waited for you while you were in uh, fighting the war. Well, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. She waited. She waited. Uh-huh. William, Williamsburg. She lived in Williamsburg when uh -huh. I was there. Okay. And uh, she, <laughs> we rented a little up, upstairs room in this house, and the only heat was what came up through a floor register. Oh, boy. So she took a job in the Ten cent store to keep warm. <laughs> <laughs> now was she a Colorado girl? Was no, she, she was Texas. Oh, she's I Texas. met her at at Austin. When uh -huh. we met, that's when I met her. Uh huh. 
That was rather interesting. At uh, when we were at Camp Swift, some of the guys would go into Austin, and at the hotel there, they had an officers' club, and a lot of the co-eds from the university liked to go there and be hostesses because they had air conditioning. <laughs> First things first, huh? That's Get a job right. because you need heat. And so that was her. I met my wife. Uh huh. She just became part of the unit. <laughs> but anyway, we finally got discharged. Took a took a discharge trip around through California down to San Diego to see some of my relatives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Finally got. Returned from a job in Montana where I had left from. And you were working there on a ranch? No, I was working for the Soil Conservation oh. Service. Doing what for them? Well, at that time I was doing range surveys. Uh huh. Uh huh. Which oh. uh, kind of work I really enjoyed mm -hmm. out mapping rangeland. What would you say? Were there any difficult transitions that you had to make from being in the military to going back to civilian life and family life? Oh, I guess the transitions were hard. We had a little problem like when I went back the first place I was assigned was a town called Ekalaka. It was right in the southeast corner of Montana. It had uh, I forget, I think one church. And